So good evening once again and welcome. Our engagement this evening will take us uh, close to eight o'clock. And uh, I, I just want to advise for anyone who will have any challenges with having to stand at the microphone, we'll get the microphone to you so that it'll make it a little easier for your engagement because we would like to ensure that all contributions are properly recorded for the purpose of the work of the committee. And permit me to introduce members of the National Advisory Committee that are present with us this evening. The committee chairman and former Speaker of the House, Mr. Barindra Sinanan SC, attorney at law and former Central Bank Deputy Governor, Dr. Terence Farrell, Mr. Winston Rudder, Public Service Commission Chair and former Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Mr. Ray Sandy, former Tobago House of Assembly Chief Administrator, and Mr. Nizam Mohammed, Attorney at Law and former Speaker of the House of Representatives, our committee that is here this evening to engage and listen and receive from you. You're more than welcome. Anywhere you'd like to sit, by all means, come on in. Thank you for being with us this evening. And so without further ado, I'll invite the chairman to deliver opening remarks. Would you please welcome Mr. Barindra Sinananesi. Good, good evening, lady and gentlemen. Welcome to our meeting this afternoon, this evening. It is a meeting where you can share your views ideas and recommendations for constitutional reform. As you are all aware, the Constitution is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights, ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide its future development in the interests of the welfare prosperity and happiness of citizens. My committee is ensuring that you, the citizens, are at the forefront cent and center of any reform initiative. This is exactly why we are here today. Constitutional reform is a very complex and lengthy process, not just in this country, but in almost all countries worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts which only reinforce the need for our collective, persistent, and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generations. I express my gratitude and that of my committee for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters, and we are here to listen. Just to give you a brief synopsis of our mandate, we are required to initiate, consult widely, and guide the national debate towards a generation of, pack of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June. Um, Later on, you will hear more about that from, from the government. So all we are here to do as a committee, our mandate is to collect your views, your ideas, your suggestions, what you like, what you don't like, your recommendations for change. And we will use the four previous reports on constitutional report blend it in with what we have been hearing, and present a, a working document in terms of reference to the, the government. We are not here to write any constitution. We are here to hear your voice. The people who would determine what's in the constitution would be the people of Trinidad and Tobago. This is why we urge you to let your voices be heard. So without further ado, I will take my seat and we'll continue with our proceedings this, after, this evening. Thank you, Chairman. Very briefly, we'll invite Dr. Terence Farrell to share just a bit of um, historical context as to 
the journey of constitution writing in Trinidad and Tobago, for want of a better description. But it's really looking through the timeline to see where we came from and where we are today. Please welcome Dr. Terence Farrell. Uh, thanks very much, Wendell, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I, 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 I always start off these um, meetings by saying that we, we are, as a committee, we are not at all phased by the numbers that we see in front of us. Whether there are two people or 200 people, it doesn't matter. Uh, what, what, what we are doing is that we are making ourselves available to the national community uh, to, to have your voices heard on the question of constitutional reform. Um, I, I, all of us here, we, 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 we are born, we start to go to school, uh, and at some point in time, you get to age 18, or in fact, when, in, in, when, I, when I was younger, it would have been age 21, and then you heard about having the right to vote and going and, and, and voting. The point I mean is that you, you, you grow up within a system, and we do things almost automatically within that system. We come to understand that there are political parties, and that these political parties run for office, and then they elect a prime minister, and then there's a president, and, 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 and there's Bacchanal in the parliament, and then there's conflict between the president and the, 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 the auditor general and the attorney general and so on and so forth. And, 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 and we, we grew up in, this, in, in a system and we kind of know it, it's there. But very few of us actually take the time to look at the document called the Constitution, which actually sets up all of these institutions which govern our lives. And we don't because the Constitution is, in fact, a legal document. It's, it's law. And there are a bunch of people, lawyers, <laughs> whose job it is to look at the Constitution and to deal with it when problems arise. And in fact, I would tell you that 95% of lawyers are not familiar with the contents of the Constitution because they simply don't deal with it on a daily basis. And there are another 5% of lawyers who they are specialists in the Constitution and what it provides. So when there are issues around the public service and the public service commission and public servants are appealing up to the Privy Council and so on, all of those things are things which are emanating from the Constitution. When people are, uh, 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 go to court because there's some kind of, of um, they're challenging the breach of their, of their constitutional rights, that is coming out of the Constitution. Now, I must say, we don't, we don't think about it. We live it because it's just, we, we, just, we just live it. And we say, this is the system that we have. And very often, we have a sense that the system really isn't working very well. So you might be voting for a particular political party. And as happened, I mean, I look, I look at the age of the audience here. And I know in 1981, people would have voted for the ONR, the ONR got 91,000 votes and not a single seat. And people would have had that experience and they would have wondered, well, how is that? What, that, that doesn't strike us as being very fair. That doesn't strike us as being right. So there are many things like that and these things go back to the Constitution because there is a section of the Constitution which says how we vote. It says we run the first past the post system. That's it. And we, we, we grew up with it, and we very often don't question it until something happens that causes us to question it. The point I'm making is that this document, this constitution that we have here, is a 1976 document. It came about because Eric Williams at the time, this is in the wake of the Black Power Movement, in the wake of the Regiment Mutiny, in the wake of considerable social unrest that went back to 1969, some of us here might remember, the bus strike and so on, a lot of turbulence. We had high unemployment in the country. And there was a no vote campaign in 1971. You remember that um, A.N.R. Robinson left the PNM in, 19, in 1970, 
formed his own party, the ACDC at the time. There was a no vote campaign which Robinson led in 1971. And in that election, the PNM won all of the seats. All 26 seats were won by the PNM until Roy Richardson um, became leader of the opposition. And, Will and William seized that opportunity to have the Wooding Commission look at the Constitution as part of that process. The Wooding Commission met from 1972 to early 1974. They carried out meetings and town halls all over the country. And they came up with what is, quite frankly, a wonderful document. A number of meaningful changes. Two, two. a number of, 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 of significant changes to how we voted, for example. They recommended proportional representation. They recommended that we abolish the Senate and that we have one a unicameral system. A number of, of, of important changes, recommended changes to the, to, the, to, to the right section. They recommended that there be a section dealing with citizens' duties and responsibilities. But Eric Williams looked at what they presented and he said, I'm not going to do that. And he essentially took the wording report and he put it in a bottom drawer and he got Ellis Clark, we believe, not quite sure, Ellis Clark to write what is essentially the 1976 constitution. And that's the constitution that we have today. There have been a couple of amendments, the Crossing of the Floor Act, and there were some amendments relating to the service commissions. There's an amendment in 2006 related to the police service commission and the selection of a police commissioner. But the point is that that constitution that was put in place in 1976 made only a few changes to the 1962 independence constitution. What we did? We went from a governor general to a president. We took away some of the powers from the prime minister, and we gave those powers to the president, those essentially powers of appointment. But essentially, this 1976 constitution we have is, if you look at it, the same pretty much as the 1962 independence constitution. And that is a constitution that was given to us by the British at independence. So here we are in 2024, and we are dealing with a set of institutions of government that are essentially 60-something 60, 60 years old. It's worse than that because, in fact, some of the institutions which were put into our constitution, like the service commissions, were set up by the British in Trinidad in the 1950s. And it's very interesting to note that many Commonwealth countries, former British colonies, became independent, and changed a lot of those institutions. Singapore changed them. Canada changed them. New Zealand changed them. But we still operating with a constitution that effectively dates back to 1962. And one of the points that we try to make is that a lot of the problems that we are experiencing here today in this society go back to this document that we are trying to operate, the institutions that it has set up, that we are trying to operate those institutions, is like trying to drive our old car, right? Trying to get it to run, and, 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 and we can't get it to run. It's not working well. The problems that we are seeing with crime, the ineffectiveness of the police service, the problems with the public service, the questions of the power of the, of the prime minister, people are complaining about the election of the president. All these things are coming out of this document, which is 60-something years old, more than 60 years old. Right? And every administration that we have had has attempted to change it. This is the fifth time that we are attempting to change this constitution. The NAR tried to change it. They instituted the Hayatali Commission in 1987, which worked for a couple of years. It was interrupted by the 1990 attempted coup. Nothing came of that. The Pandey administration made some important changes to legislation affecting the Constitution, like the Freedom of Information Act, Judicial Review Act, the Integrity in Public Life Act, because the Integrity Commission is set up in the Constitution, 
And so we had the Integrity in Public Life Act, which essentially elaborates how the Integrity Commission works. That was under the Pandey administration. The Manning administration came in in 2001, 2002, and it too embarked on a process of constitutional reform. Manning asked Ellis Clark to write a draft constitution. Some of you may remember that, the one where we talked about being an executive president. And Ellis Clark did that draft. And then there was a bunch of businessmen and trade union people and religious leaders, including the archbishop and uh, um, some other religious leaders, trade unionists, and so on. The Principles of Fairness Committee, who in 2006 did a draft constitution. And the UNC in 2013 had the Ramada Committee, which went around the country, much as we are doing or we have been doing, <clears throat> came up with a report to, for constitutional reform. Every administration has been attempting to do constitutional reform. Why? Because this, the Constitution is flawed. It's no longer working. So this is the fifth time <clears throat> that we are doing it. And some people will say, well, this is a political ploy, it's a political gimmick on the part of the government. Be that as it may, if it is, that's what it is. But my view is, our view is as a committee, is that this is an opportunity for the population, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago to now say what we want change in this constitution. We told the Wooding Commission what changes we wanted. We told Higher Tally what changes we wanted. The Principles of Fairness articulated changes we wanted. The Ramana Committee outlined changes we wanted. And we are going to be putting together some report, report with recommendations from you in terms of what you want to see in the constitution. And the situation today in 2024, even though Ramadan was only 2013, the situation today that is facing your children and your grandchildren is profoundly different from even what the Ramadan committee was looking at in 2013. We're not talking about AI. We're not talking about, about questions of access to personal data. We're not talking about deep fakes. We're not talking, we're not talking about climate change. And those are the kinds of things that our children and our grandchildren are going to have to face in the world that is coming up. And we need to have a constitution and a set of institutions that can respond to that. That's why this is important. So we invite you to make your voices heard. We want to hear from you. We've been all around the country. This is the second to last town hall that we're having. We are meeting with some of the young people again in Port of Spain on Saturday. We go back to Tobago next week for another meeting with the young people in Tobago, uh, and we would have covered the country in terms of these kinds of meetings. We would have received almost 900 submissions via email from the public, and we would have received a number of submissions from civil society organizations, from political parties, and so on, that have come into us. So we have all of that material. We want to hear your voices here in Diego Martin this evening, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Terence Farrell. So ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, it's now your opportunity to make your contributions. Uh, in the first instance, the length of time for your contribution is just about five minutes. Now, uh, it's five minutes, but I won't get on my feet immediately to the second or the third uh, a second after that, so you do have a little bit of leeway to make your point and wrap up your point, if only to allow each person who wants to make a contribution a chance to be accommodated in the time we have, and if we happen to get through all and there are some adjacent or additional points that you'd like to make, certainly they can be considered within the time frame that we're working with. So if you see me on my feet, you've already passed five minutes. That's just to guide you. And in support of Dr. Farrell's point, um, change is constant. Marine Square became Independence Square, is known to the young people as the Brian Lara Promenade. King George V Park is known to the young people as Mandela Park. And it goes on and on. If you Think of a Holiday Inn became a Crown Plaza, became a Radisson. So it's only to say that whatever we 
are looking at in the rear view mirror as the Constitution of 1962, heeding the words of Dr. Farrell, the generations to come might be inheriting what we contribute today. Think about them as you make your contributions in the now, because it could very well be another 60 years before there might be a reconstitution. So some thoughts. Very well. The microphones are available both front and middle of the room, and I invite you now to make your contributions. We are happy to listen to you. First up. Sorry? And just a reminder, as you receive the microphone or you come to it, just kindly indicate your name and the general area from where you're from. It's really so that we can continue to keep our information up to date as to who's contributed. Coming to you. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Many thanks for the opportunity to say a few words on what I would like to discuss, and that's the abolition of the service commissions. Uh, before I get into that, I want to say that um, Dr. Farrell's remarks are germane to what is taking place in our society today. And I'll sum it up by quoting a newspaper report a couple of weeks ago, which came from the heads of government, CARICOM governments, who will be rating Cricket West Indies for destroying cricket using the same systems year after year. That, that really is what's happening to us now. I think your, your, your mission is a most important one. I, I, I'm not too sure that the rest of the country is taking it serious, and that's, that's where the problem lies. First of all, um, I mean no disrespect to anyone, to the committee, to a court, to anybody in what I'm about to say, and I'll try and remain from calling, <laughs> refrain from calling names. For years, I have written in the press, I have challenged one of our service commission um, heads years ago on, on TV, in the press. We, we had some real arguments trying to get some kind of debate going on the service commissions. The bottom line is the service commissions have destroyed our institutions thereby destroying Trinidad and Tobago. And I challenge anyone to debate me on that publicly, to say that I'm talking nonsense, and it's not so. The, the Civil Service Commission, Civil Service destroyed. Teaching service destroyed. Police service absolutely destroyed. And on and on, I can go on. There is, if right now, the legal, the legal service commission presides over people put into remand yard for 20 and 25 years, not being charged for a murder or whatever in there for, only to be finally let out. Um, this recently, the 10-year-old murder case that came up in the press two days ago. Ten years, the legal, the legal fraternity should be ashamed of itself to allow our legal system to become what it was. This is far beyond third world. This is fifth world. The police service, which, and, and let me say, I, I have been a member of um, in, my, in a former life, com, uh, I was privileged to be a member of a crime commission formed by 
Patrick Manning, under the leadership of Silas Clark. It was a privilege to belong to that. What came out of that was a lot of positive things, including us getting Michael de Lavasi to be the Chief Justice at the time to bring the backlog up, which he did. And from the time the government changed, they threw it out, and that was the end of that. I don't know if people understand how serious our situation is, particularly in relation to the police service. The police service has been destroyed in the way that it used to be a police force, a quasi-military unit. They, they held their heads high. Today, it's a police service operating a 40-hour week. And I don't know if you remember, sometime ago, they decided to teach the politicians a lesson and shut the country down. You remember that? They shut the country down. Has anybody been taken to task for that? No. I could go on with a series of examples as to what has happened to our police service. You could not become, you could not, being a quasi-military unit, you had to be trained in England um, before you could get into the officer corps. Well, it's the police service commission destroyed the officer corps, got rid of them, and, and turned it into the civil service that it is. It's incredible to me that we, as citizens of a country, have allowed our country to reach this stage. How, how we reach here? Right? Do, do we know that the head of the gangs in Haiti is a policeman? Are we fearful that that is what we're heading for? I certainly am. The fact is that you, you treat, the, you treat the, the, the police service, you know, we hired, first of all, the, the Scotland Yard left, they were invited to come to Trinidad to do something about the police service. They left Trinidad to be going disgust, never to return. They say, you're going back here, right? Because of what they encountered here. Then we hired two Canadian policemen recently to take over. They worked for a year. I can attest to the fact that what they did in that year was incredible. They, they took four police stations and made them model stations and turned them around. And what happened? The head of the police service commission said, we want a local, and they fired the hotel and sent them. Pay them a set of money, pay them two years salary plus. I mean, to, for me, under the present circumstance, and the way our security services are run, and the way our institutions are run, we have little hope. And what we need is a sea change in the Constitution as to the governance of Trinidad and Tobago. Absolute sea change. Cannot continue to run this country in the fashion that is being run under the present systems and the present circumstances. I thank you for your. Thank you. We have to ask for your name for the record, please. Frank Boutet, and I, I put in a written submission some weeks ago. So thank I, you. I forgot to mention that. Thank you, Mr. Boutet. Yeah. The floor is open. Who else would like to contribute? By all means, let us know. Come forward. Yes. Yes. Thank you for being with us. Good evening and welcome. Just let us have your name first, please. Uh, my name is Eric Moussa. 
I live in Samachi Street in the Ramate. Welcome. I want to complain about a matter I had a very long time and I'm not getting no justice at all, no matter who I go to, everybody covering up. You know what I'm saying? In 1984, I was charged for murder. In 1986, my case finished 16 at the 10th. In 1986, I was brought in guilty but insane, and I was sent to the mental hospital by Judge Crane. In 1989, I was sent home by the president. In 1991, I was driving a vehicle without no license and insurance. I was held by Western police. I went in, a child, I plead guilty to the charge. They tell me, I find her 800. I didn't pay the money. I didn't have the money to pay. So I was going to do 30 days. While I was doing the 30 days, on the seven days, they were going to transform into Golden Rope Prison. And they asked me, Eric Musa here. I said, I do Eric Musa. They say, well, you have another charge. You charge for murder. I tell them my case finished. They tell me I is a sick man and I do my charge for murder. And my case finished in 1986, and I was sent home by the president. I have all the documents and everything right here, man. Long. After the president's pardon, the results have moved around for me on the 27th of July in 1991, and they keep me back for 28 extra days. The lawyer filed a writ and sent to the court. We went to court. The case never had no hearing. Money has been paid. Three sets of money has been paid. Money has been paid before even get a date to go to court. Two sets of money has been paid. Ninety days before I reached the court. Two sets of money has been paid. And I'm not getting justice because I passed to the mental hospital and everybody covering up. I take part in the commercial of inquiry, look at the paper here, to improve the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago. And they say that I am mentally ill, and I want to improve the administration of justice in Trinidad and Tobago. And I need my, my money just like anybody else, not just injection and tablet. I need my money. I don't know how it can help me. But I need my money. I need justice. 30 years now I'm trying to get my money. This is 10,950 days. That's in my head for years, every morning, every day. And everybody in the afternoon, or well, how people get into a new house, get into a cell, because I passed to the mental hospital. I don't know who they pay the money to. I never get a cent. Up to the day, I never get a cent. And they just leave me out just like that. Yeah. So it's a no. Nobody to stand up for mentally ill people. I think about 20 dollars and none of them Douglas Mendez wrote a letter to them. He said, he tell them, um, it appears from the court record that the last step taking place by the plaintiff was on April the 19th of 94, when the statement of claim was served on you. No defense was filed and served. And I can only assume a decision has been taken not to defend this matter. Since then, the plaintiff has suffered a misfortune of having the two attorney who are responsible for his matter, assuming that Mr. Lionel Bridgman and Mr. Egard. Mr. Mercer has been making effort to have his matter handled by other persons, but it appears that great difficulties have been experienced on each occasion in discovering what has been done by its previous attorney. Despite the fact that a matter might be deemed by the rule of the court to have been dismissed, but I am of the view in the circumstances a good case can be made for the exercise in irritation, jurisdiction of the court to instate it having regard to your failure to file a defense. However, the possibility and intent to settle the plaintiff claim for damages. I'm writing that the state to ask for your comment to settle the matter and to make a payment to the plaintiff as Bratty Douglas Mendez say in the case, never settle and he went to jail, so he's a Queen's Council lawyer. Okay. I want to thank you for making your contribution. It has been recorded. And for, and for bringing the matter to 
a point of attention in this environment. So you wish to add to this, or are you ready to make your contribution? Okay, um, I think, forgive me, I may be misplaced. You seem to be able-bodied. Would you be able to, for the purposes, uh, return to the microphone stand, please? I invite you to do so. Thank you very much. Yes, by all means, come forward. So we just need your name, and you may, be, you may go ahead, please. Yeah, good evening to the panel. Yes, hearing you. You hearing you? Yeah. Yes. A pleasant good evening to the chairman, all members, the public. I would like to briefly say... Your my, name, please. My name, oh, sorry. Shepard Horace Shockness is my name. Shepard? Horace Shockness. Shockness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to state categorically some of the things that I would like to see change, particularly with regards to offices and office holders. My main concern is that I think for us in this country, just as it is in the army, where persons hold office up to the age of 55, I think it will level the playing field in the public service also. I would say it will generally increase more persons to be employed instead of persons being working up to the age of 70, 65, and so on. Because we have a young and vibrant society right now of people graduating degrees, and they can't get more employment because there are persons who are still there working at the age of 70. Now, these persons are supposed to be off the job at the age of 55, getting some kind of annuity that they contribute towards. And in that essence now, the younger generation will be able to come through and we'll have what we call a better system. So I would like to recommend that the age of retirement be moved to age 55 and give a much more wider spec of persons to be employed. That's my contribution. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your contribution, Mr. Sharpness. Microphones are available for those who have just arrived. Welcome. You have about five minutes in your presentations, and you're more than welcome to make your way to either of the microphones in the room. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Good night. My name is Danley Cuban. I'm from Devonville. Welcome. Um, I had no intention of making a contribution here tonight, but um, based on the turnout, you know, I think I'll say a couple of words. Um, I think um, we need to have uh, electoral reform in that um, you should have, I, I recommend a fixed election date instead of a you know, a prime minister walking around with the date in his pocket. Let's have a fixed election date. And um, I think our first election, 1956, was sometime in 24th of September. I want to suggest that we have our elections on the, la on the last Monday, the third or the last Monday in September, in keeping with our first election in 1956. And continue on that basis. I would I want to suggest that um, members of elected members should not be members of cabinet. You should have you know elected members. We need to have them looking after the communities. But after election, we don't see our representatives. We don't see them. They are in, you know they in their offices, cabinet. You know, they, they got to go to um, parliament maybe one day, cabinet one day, um, other matters of state for one day, and, and they, we don't see them. So I want to suggest that elected members are given an office in the constituency. 
where they will attend to the matters, you know, the, the, the matters dealing with the, the, the population. And um, cabinet should be selected from experts in the field. Okay. Maybe the, 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 the leader of the party, the leader of the, the, the party with the, with the majority of, of, of seats would be responsible for forming the cabinet. And he or she would be chairman of the, of the, the, um, of the cabinet. But the cabinet members must not be elected members. Because right now you have elected members. There are cabinet ministers, elected members. They are members of the, the, the executive of the party. And, you know, it's, it's too much work. And we need to see them attending to our business. I mean, I haven't seen our representative. I saw our representative once. He came around and wanted to find out what is the problem. And we told him, look, we have, we have the problem A, problem B, and not a word, not a word. Since then, you know, so. But those are my, um, you know, as I said, I, I didn't intend to, come to just say anything, but based on the turnout, um, I thought, well, I should make a small contribution. Thank you, Mr. Cupid. Good evening. Good evening sir. You know, I always rearrange. I like to speak to the audience, and I mean no offense yes. to the chair. Yeah. Um, my name is Mickey Matthews, and I have been following the process of constitution reform ever since it started with the Wooden Commission. I've attended to most of these sittings. And I dismissed this notion of the Constitution exercise being a, a futile one. I'm a product of it. When I started, I, I couldn't say what I was saying now. And Whatever the Constitution says, you've got to understand it. And this is an exercise of learning. Nobody's going to read the Constitution just like that and understanding. It's exercises as these that make you better able to understand it. And if you, what you can't change, you're angry to suit. And the fact that we haven't have, uh, what I should say, um, the reforms that we want is because we can't get it. You need consensus. This thing got to pass in Parliament and there must be support in the Parliament for it. And when you um, consider all the exercises of constitutional reform, I think the Clark draft which uh, Mr. Manning ordered Clark to do is one of the best. And I'll tell you why. I say we're ignoring it very much here. Because he, Clark based the entire plan of his reform on consensus in the House. He was cynical as everybody else. He said we couldn't have constitution reform. Where would we get it? He said, for, uh, to change a president, I think you need a fourth majority, is it that? Or two, in some instances, two thirds, in some instances, four fifths. And there wasn't that in the House. But then he heard that Mr. 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 Pandey was against the office of the president as con a ceremonial president with, con with um, executive uh, functions as well. And Manning was against it too. So you had a real possibility of a consensus. <clears throat> and he proceeded, if, if you look at that draft, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 Dr. Farrell, you would see that he kept whatever arrangement he made, he kept 
the consensus intact, right? And the real difficulty he, get, he got was to reorganize the parliament, right? We don't have a parliament here. What we have, uh, um, a, we have a, 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 a prime minister who's really a president, effectively a president, but he's not ring fence. He's not contained as presidents all over the world have. If you have an executive, what do you do surround him? In any organization, whether it is, whether it is the, uh, 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 um, a, a trade union or a business, if you have a president, you've got to surround him, an executive, to watch what he does, because you're going to have abuse of power. And we don't have that in Trinidad. <laughs> and Clark tried to, to do that. He took powers away from the president, or the, prime, or the prime minister, as he put it, and he put it in the hands of a parliament. But his real confusion, the real difficulty he had, was how do you get this parliament into being? And the process was very contorted and so on. And that was the major failure of, of that. But that's not what I want to engage in talking about this evening. The thing has, that has occupied my mind, really, is this question about the young and the old. We had a very, very brilliant presentation last night from a 20-year-old young man. And I, I, I think he was most pointed than any one of us on what the issue involving the young people and the old is. In, in every generation, you have this conflict between young and old. As the older generation moves off the stage, the young are there, and they watch them, and sometimes they're very impatient, and they want them to get out of the stage very quickly. So they could. And sometimes, as impatient as they are, they may think in terms of veneration of the old, which is to say they talk, the bad talk the, the old. They want them to go off, but they, did, they think they have done a good job, and they are quite gracious and so on. That happens in any generation. When I was a young man, I remember, and I was like that. I, I, I came of age at a time when there was young power in the world. And a fellow named, um, I think it's Danny the Red, a young man, he almost bring down the French government, a German guy. And that spread all over the world and so on. And we had our own version of it in a man called Mike, Michael Alls. And the, the first politician I see, the first public meeting I attended was one Michael Alls called in Faisabad down there, and I heard him. And I myself spoke at a, at a, at a meeting of, the, they call a SPE, uh, uh, St. Patrick Assembly of Youth. And we used to have, we used to have a public speaking contest. And I remember saying, um, a line saying, um, get out of the way, Dad, you and give the youth a chance. So I'm saying that to say that we always like that. Every generation, when we're young, we want the old to get off the stage. But I think what I'm hearing from the young these days, there's an edge to it. An edge to it that, that echoes a, a rare discontent. Right? And they disguise it. They like to make you feel it's their style and your chick. To say, you know, to say, get out of the way, uh, old, you know, call you um, what, papa or tanti or something like, or uncle or something, everything, which, is, which can't be a respectful, in my view, um, salutation. When you meet somebody, you, you salute them to the best, you say, best chief or something. <clears throat> so, but I think when you look at the situation we are handling the young, there is real reason to be angry. And the anger is among the Afros, more than Indos or any other sector of the country. They say it with an anger. They meet one another. They meet their old folks. And they, you could see a despair, an angst in their voice. 
And I think it is because they sense what I sense. And that is that we are, be quit, we are handing to them a poison chalice. We are deaths out from an age of plenty. Railway this country was 50 rich, 50, 50 rich. For almost 20 years, a golden age, they say. Do, do, am I overstepping the time, sir? Yes, you do. Right. You can make your point. Wrap it up. Yeah, and, 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 um, and when you look at what has happened to the young Afros, vis a vis their cohorts among Indos and the others, there must be despair. We have handed them a poison chalice. And I want, I want to see a meeting with them here. And I think they should confront us on that. How would we let the country to arrive at such a, a, a chilling state? We have to answer. And I want to say one thing before I close. And that is that um, when we started the, this exercise under the Wooding Commission, the people of um, the young people didn't come. And the pe to me, the people, and, and we didn't have large, large numbers. I am seeing in these meetings the people who didn't come to the Wooding Commission now coming. Mm -hmm. They sent something wrong too. They sense that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. They're holding themselves responsible. And I think that's a good thing. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. By all means, you may make your contribution. Thoughts on the Constitution, things that you'd like to have the committee consider. Yes, by all means, welcome, good evening. Right. We just need your name as you start, please. Good evening to all. Good evening. My name is Ronald Bartolo. I live in Diamondville. And I would like to make a straightforward suggestion governing the rules of people in public life. I would like to talk to members of parliament who when they are indicted before the courts, are still allowed to take part in parliamentary proceedings. Unlike people in other organizations who, when they are charged with misbehavior, are suspended from their job with full pay, until such time that the outcome of investigations are done. I'm suggesting that we apply a similar thing, members of parliament who are before the courts. They be suspended with pay until the courts have delivered justice to their cases. I expect that a couple of things will come out of this. One, the proverbial, as you say, kicking of the can down the road, which is a common thing today with our people in law, when they want something to be delayed. We can address that in some manner. Avoid that kicking of the can down the road, and of course, which is delayed justice. Second, I hope that it would mean that people who are the voters who select representatives will now take a more serious view and do due diligence on the integrity of the people who they select to come up for parliamentary elections. That is my contribution. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We invite you to make your contributions, please. And if there isn't anyone new and any of our former presenters and contributors wish to supplement or add, you may so do. By all means, go right ahead. We just have to turn the mic around in order to facilitate. Well, good evening, everyone. Let's just turn it back to as we. Thank you. Right. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. My name is Kuwin Benassia. I'm from Dugumatan. Welcome. Um, really specifically, one thing which has to do with education. Education is obviously mentioned in the Constitution, um, but more so the right of the parent specifically. And, and, and they've had in recent times, you know, um, policies on education and so on. But we've, we've run into at times um, where, um, or I should say specifically, I homeschool. And there's a homeschool association and so on and so on. The whole idea of education, but the specific right of the parent where it says a parent must educate their child or right to education. But it's, it's, it's kind of vague in how it's worded. But one of the things we've seen is that there was an attack on homeschooling parents. Literally, it felt like an attack because it, a policy was being drafted that said basically, if you're a homeschooler, you must get permission to homeschool. And while the decision is being made, your child must be re registered and attend in a public school or some other school, while the decision is being made. And, and so I really saw that as an attack on my right to simply educate my child as a responsible parent, as a responsible citizen. And, and so, you know, I'm really looking at that right in the Constitution not being, maybe being more specifically geared towards protecting the right of the parent, where what is worded there is fine, it seems fine, but it was, it seemed as though it wasn't being interpreted in a different way by the Ministry of Education. And that right was almost, it felt as it was being, you know, taken away, so to speak. But that, that is something that's being worked on. There is a homeschooling association. I'm not involved with the, I'm a member of it, but not at any um, executive level or anything in that. I'm just a member. But specifically education and the right of a parent to be able to educate their children, how they see fit for the benefit of the child and the wider community and so on. Um, and if there could probably be more clarity where that is concerned. In, and, and, and once again, it's not education in general, but specifically more the right of the parent to choose how they would like to see their children educated. We talked about, you know, we heard about AI and the advancements of technology and so on. There's a lot of different things taking place. I know within the Ministry of Education, which is separate, but specifically the right of the parent to be able to choose how they would like to educate their children without having the Ministry of Education then have policies that attack us as parents who choose to do the same, to do what the Constitution tells us we're allowed to do, you know? So maybe it could be a little clearer in how it's worded with regards to the right of the parent to educate their children. 
Um, and that's pretty much it in terms of that. At least that's one, one aspect of, um, of what I would like to contribute, you know? Simple, straightforward. That's it? Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Benajide, one of the members of our committee just wants to engage on this subject. Yes, Kuin. Do you think that um, that right should also go with um, the fact that your parents should have some kind of um, formal um, teaching ability or, or follow up a particular uh, curriculum or something like that? Well, Shouldn't there be some kind of... Um, there, 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 there is a, a form that we would have filled out with regards to informing them. And it does ask, you know, well, what was our level of education and so on. But to then turn around and have that block me from choosing how to educate my child. I, I, I'm, we, how I could put it? Homeschooling specifically is parents educating their children. And to limit, and, and we still have to prepare our children for exams if we, whether it's local, foreign, you know. So, it, you know, it, the, 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 there's a policy being developed where that's concerned. But specifically with, so, so the, the policy would say, well, um, you know, what is the curriculum being used? Or to, to give the ministry an, an, an idea, because obviously they're looking at in general the safety of the child and so on. So there's some things that the ministry is requesting, but specifically in the Constitution, that right for me to be able to choose, which, which is there. It says that parents have the right to educate the, or, you know, to educate the child, but, or that any child, um, you know, any parent or guardian or somebody supervising it, um, having legal supervision of a child must have that child educated. Um, but with regards to the protection of the child, there's a lot of stuff in place already for that. Um, but specifically, the, the parent, you know, being able... Let me give you an example of something else. Rain falls in my yard. Rain falls, I don't know about you all, but rain falls in my yard. And on occasion, water pools and it runs off. Now, if I put a drum there and I fill it, and that water falls from heaven above and it goes into that drum, I could get in trouble. So constitutional reform for me should protect me if that drum accumulates water and I decide to wet my plants and things like that. There's a lot of archaic things that exist. They may, ex they may exist as policies, but I believe I should have the right to the water that may accumulate in my yard. If, if I choose to catch it from my roof and put it in a drum, uh, you know, there's legal, well, how I could put it, I could get in trouble for capturing water. You, you, you know what I'm saying, you know? So, so there's basic stuff I understand within the Constitution. There are basic things that need to, to be altered to protect us as citizens, but some of it is policy within other institutions. But as a parent, just to answer your question there, there's a lot of protection for the child there's but as a citizen my child then grows up and may choose to homeschool their child and it's becoming more and more difficult when the ministry of education says in order for you to choose to homeschool your child fill out this form inform us as to what's going on now which, which is normally what takes place you inform them we're going to be homeschooling we took the child out to public or whatever what they're saying now is you have to get permission. And that permission must be approved, right? And that approval process is a process. Meanwhile, your child must be in whatever institution registered or trying to be registered to sit there until that process is approved. But once again, that's a policy being worked on. That's something separate, you know, but just that's specifically the right of me to be able to educate my child how I see fit, you know? Thank you very much for your contribution and for the points raised.
Good evening and welcome. All right. Pleasant good evening, members on the panel, the moderator, the audience on my right, and the audience on my left. My name is Andre L. Akers. I am from Tunapuna. Okay. You got it right this time. All right. An Italian economist by the name of Carlo Sopola wrote an essay in 1976 entitled The Basic Laws of Human Stupidity. And in it, he said, in all societies, there are four types of people. There are helpless people, denoted by H, whose actions benefit others but cause losses to themselves. Take, for example, the informants in high-risk communities who inform the police about the crimes taking place who then inform the criminals, who then execute the informants in the, the high-risk communities. Then there are intelligent people, those persons whose actions benefit themselves, but also benefit others in society. Take, for example, Mr. Afra Raymond. He indicated last year that it is he and two other persons raised $650,000 to draft the Procurement Act, which was then handed to the government and which was passed in Parliament. We have bandits in society denoted by B. Those are the people whose actions benefit themselves but cause losses to others. Take, for example, the big fish in the society, which is creating a whole host of social, economic, and political issues by flooding the, the country with drugs and guns and bribing public officials, some public officials. And then last we, lastly, we have stupid people, those persons whose actions cause losses to others and also losses to themselves, like what Plain Clothes sang in his Calypso in the 1980s about Trinidadians making fun a seriousness, including corruption and laughing. Chipola indicated that Chipola indicated that stupidity is independent of other variables, race, class, gender, ethnicity. It do have people with PhDs that are stupid. He also indicated also to that we tend to underestimate the number of stupid people in society. The, among the, the number of stupid people in society is far greater than we anticipate. And lastly indicated, out of all the people in society, stupid people are the most dangerous set of people in the society because their modus operandi is indeterminate. We know for a fact that helpless people are motivated, motivated by altruism in which they do things out of the goodness of the heart. We know intelligent people are motivated by self-interest, but their behavior is curtailed by ethics. We know that bandits in society believe that the ends justify the means, and they will win if they can, lose if they must, but always cheat. I believe in this society, um, this country, we're in a mess. But the country fairly stable in the sense that the number of helpless people and intelligent people exceed the number of stupid people and bandits in society. But the trajectory we are heading, the number of stupid people and bandits in society, um, bandits will eventually dominate the society. And when those people dominate the society, Democratic principle, um, the, the, we, will, we will find ourselves in a democratic trap where democratic principles would not work for the country, where there'd be a referendum, um, first past the post system, judicial review, the Freedom of Inf Information Act, seeking refuge from the courts to remedy issues in the country. So I believe that to prevent this prediction from happening, is that we have to curtail the stupid people and the bandits in society. As I mentioned before in the previous meetings, 
have provided recommendations to deal with the bandits in society, but to deal with the stupid people in society, their behavior is a result of ignorance. We have two types of ignorance. It have people knowingly know that they're ignorant and their behavior is harming themselves and others. And then we have people in society who are ignorant of the fact that their ignorance is affecting themselves and others. I believe in the society that it have plutocrats and sinister groups in the society with their tentacles all over that is using ignorance to their advantage. One way I see this manifesting is through the media, where a lot of incomplete and inaccurate information has been peddled in the media. And if the facts are being report reported in the media, it is being put forward in a manner that it is difficult for the average person to comprehend. So therefore, I believe that we need an Ofcom model in the United Kingdom where media houses that in, who do not adhere to their journalistic principles will be punished. Two, I am seeing of late that these plutocrats and sinister groups in society is using social media to, to um, promote hate and to spread a lot of inaccurate information. So I believe in the Constitution, sorry, I believe in the Constitution, we need an Ofcom model in the, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, which was the first regulatory body in the world, that was four or five years ago, which was responsible for punishing social media companies like Facebook, um, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, but also punish users of the system while at the same time respecting people's freedom to speak. I also believe also too that with respect, no, I also believe with respect to the, the National Archives, I believe that the National Archives, well, I believe for people to find out what is exactly going on in the country, they need to dig, dig deeply into the National Archives. But I believe if people dig in, the, dig in the National Archives and they know what's going on in the country, then the plutocrats and certain groups in society may want to destroy them records. We already lost some of the records in the Red House fire many years ago. I was in the National Archive um, last week, and I've been told that to scan all the documents in the National Archive, they need $100 million to scan all the documents. Also, to the National Archives, I've been told also to, they are operating paycheck to paycheck. So I believe with the National Archives, the National Archives should be a statutory board or if it's with its own budget, at least gain a 0.01% out of the royalties from oil and gas. Or if it is not a statutory board, for it to be under parliament so that the politicians would not be able to use their minions to destroy the, 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 the records held in the national archives. I also believe that I also believe that the reason why individuals do not know what is going on also too is that it have a problem with the education system. And I believe that the textbooks commission, if I'm correct, under the Ministry of the Ed Education should no longer be under the Ministry of Education but be under some independent body um, to, to, to prevent the risk politicians distorting the history of Trinidad and Tobago and letting political ideologies seep through the education system. I also believe also too that the system is not fostering critical thinkers in the society. And I believe that with the textbooks commission or whatever commission you call it, it should be able to foster critical thinking because that is a major problem because a lot of false information is being peddled but people are not equipped with the tools to, when they are faced with arguments to break it up to know what is the facts, what is the, 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 the assumptions, what is the underlying legal principle 
what is the theory and what is the conclusion and see if, if it is logically true. And if it is logically true, to see if those arguments are valid. And one more thing before I go, I would like to take up what Mr. Nizam Mohammed said yesterday, where it is very important to make it mandatory for civics to be taught in all the schools. Mandatory. So at least people will have a sense of patriotism for Trinidad and Tobago. I would like to thank the panel of NACCR for giving me the opportunity to speak. I would like to thank, thank the members of the audience for giving me the undivided attention. And definitely, most importantly, I would like to thank the moderator for being patient enough <laughs> to allow me to complete. You're very welcome, yeah. Mr. Akers, and your assistant. Yes, and my assistant, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for your contribution. Yes, by all means. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, you can do. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Simone Edwin. Um, I live in Diamond Vale as well. Welcome. I just have one um, suggestion um, that I personally, for me, as a sole trader, um, I have heard, you know, different comments about the old age um, pension, all the issues that we are having for that and the extension of that age. Um, and from what I understand from my business, um, conducting business, sole traders aren't allowed to pay NIS. And I, for me, that was quite weird to hear. Um, um, taking into consideration that we have an issue with um, pensions being paid only through your employers. Um, I think that there needs to be serious constitutional reform with um, just a suggestion to put forward that the, a situation needs to come out or a panel needs to be um, convened to figure out a system to have sole traders pay NIS that could possibly contribute to the existing problem of, you know, having to continuously extend the old age, um, well, the age of for retirement, that is, um, because for me, it becomes worrisome where you have a, a population now that a lot of us young people are becoming self-employed and entrepreneurs. We are tired of the system of working for, you know, private companies or just in general. Um, and I heard somebody mention something, something about us getting very frustrated. We are very frustrated at what we see going on and sometimes our result is to still contribute to Trinidad and to be because I can't picture myself living anywhere else in the world. Um, so I want to contribute to my country, but sometimes the frustration gets to the best of us and we would step aside to do our own thing. But now, where you want to be, uh, you know, fulfill your civic duty, do the right thing in terms of business, to now hear that you can't contribute and then what's going to happen to me when I turn 65? I have no, what, nothing to get or I have to rely on, thank God I would have been, you know, privy to... Um, you know, just getting advice from older heads, which I do accept as a young person. Don't think that all young people just want to get rid of old people. That's not the case uh, most times. Um, but I would have gotten advice on what an annuity is. Most of us, um, most of my friends, most people my age may not have been privy or um, exposed to people that would have given them that kind of advice. Um, so I know that I am... Um, secure in a sense when I get to that age that I would at least have something to you know take care of me but what about the other young people who are starting businesses who are doing well for themselves but it's kind of like the, 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 we feel sometimes as if the country is pushing us to do the wrong thing so you keep all your money for yourself and then not thinking about later down the line what's going to happen and then you run into issues later down so I think that needs to be seriously dealt with um, fig figuring out a system of, you know, obviously accountability, yes, um, making sure that things are done in the right way, in the right forum, um, just for us to follow the rules, because we want to follow the rules, but if there is no rule to help us, like, then kind of setting us up for a little bit of failure there. So that's what. 
Thank you very much for your contribution. Appreciate it. There's room for more. All right. Well, we're getting to the point where we will bring our engagement to a close based on everyone's ability to share with us their sentiments and their views. I would just give one more minute, and if there's no one else to contribute, we'll be preparing for our close. Yes, Mr. Akers. It's, it's very heartening with respect to the elderly gentleman um, with what is occurring with him. Um, I know with the legal profession, act attorneys supposed to adhere to ethics. And it means that, how much attorneys have changed so far? How much attorneys have changed? About attorneys, you pay them? Yeah. So it means that those individuals have ethics. But the dominant belief in the society is that attorneys do not go after attorneys. So therefore, I believe it cannot be himself to himself. It cannot be the police service investigating the police service. We need, as I mentioned before, we need a solicitor's, regulator, re, solicitor's regulatory authority in the United Kingdom, which is made up of, which report to parliament, and it, made, it is made up of attorneys, and it is only made up of lay, lay men or lay women. Mm -hmm. So I believe that those who are attorneys who are taking advantage of the elderly gentlemen and others, they will be punished. And if they are punished, it could send a signal to the others that the attorneys are officers of the court. And if they fail in their duties, it means the court also to fail in their duties. And if the court fail in, in, in their duties, it means that citizens wouldn't have faith in the system. And if citizens do not have faith in the system, it means that citizens will resort to other means mm -hmm. to remedy their issues. And we're actually seeing it panning out that if you want to deal with somebody, we don't want that. We want a democratic system where the, just, uh, where the, the wheels of justice will take, take its course. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, good evening. I have noted your arrival. We are getting to the point where we were about to close off. So I don't want to deny you if by chance you did have something that you've either prepared or wish to contribute within the time frame that's allotted. If there isn't anything, we're preparing to close. So would you like to make a contribution this evening? Did you come prepared to? Just to see how it was going. Yes, by all means. What's your question? Yes. Just, yes, just come a little closer so we can hear you, please. If you do have some suggestions, because I saw the ad late, um, I know the deadline for April 15th has passed. Is there another avenue to get those suggestions in? You wish to make some suggestions, and you're looking for the alternate avenue, given that the deadline for submitting. This would have been the option. No email. What you may be in a position to do, the gentleman who is part of the team will facilitate you there with being able to at least put some information down for us, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. It's, it's quite all right. I just wanted to make sure that we accommodated you in case you had something you wanted to share this evening. I am guided. I am guided. I am guided. I am guided. Mm, 
according to my information this evening, I have to hand over to someone to Okay, so we'll ask Mr. Rudder if you could kindly facilitate with our vote of thanks this evening, please, sir. Good evening, folks of Digo Martin. My colleague, Mr. Farrell, in his opening statement said, we are not necessarily worried by numbers or concerned about numbers. I think it's important for us to listen carefully, document faithfully information provided by citizens, however large, however small the gathering. We want to express our gratitude to the 15 faithful in the Digo Martin area who have been with us this evening. You may be surprised to know that even amongst the 15, there were some gems of ideas that we have not picked up elsewhere. So that coming here for us is never and has never been considered a waste of time. And it had in fact not turned out to a waste of time. If we hadn't come here this evening, those gems that have been generated in the discussion here tonight, we would not have obtained. So we want to express our gratitude and we want to assure you that together with what information we have garnered elsewhere, they would be faithfully, authentically represented, analyzed, and presented in our working document, which is the basis of which this is foundational and the basis. So, that having been said, we wish you Godspeed, a safe journey back to where you came from. I know some of the members here tonight came from the deep south and some from the far east. So thank you for being here with us in Digo Martin. And good night to each, each and every one of you. Thank you very much for the closing remarks. Thanks to the committee and to each and every one of you and all the folks involved in putting the arrangements into place. We wish you a safe onward journey to your homes. God bless you all. Good night.